A very good Tuesday afternoon to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us today as we are continuing our walk through history and the story of God as he has revealed to us in the Bible, in his holy scriptures. Thank you for, for joining us today. Hope that you're having a great Tuesday. Hope that you have been able to enjoy the blessings God has given you and that you've even been able to be a blessing to others. That's uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this new chapter of our study as we have progressed past the book of the Judges, and now we're into the much shorter book of Ruth. And Alan, as, as we're making this transition from Judges to Ruth, uh, it really is a, a transition in many ways. It's a transition from a very long, drawn-out story to a much shorter one. It is a, a transition from a very dark chapter in Israel's history to maybe a, a, a brighter chapter where, where the future now is laid out for us within this text. Uh, we, we, we're appreciative of you joining us today. Hope this will be a blessing to you. And if you, maybe you're behind, maybe you've just found these studies that Alan and I have been engaged in, in over the past year. I was just telling a minute ago that today, it, this study is the 77th that we've done as we began in Genesis and we've been working our way up to where we are now. We've had 76 studies before this, and maybe you're, maybe if you're new to what we're doing, please feel free to look either on the Facebook page, the Pleasant Plains Church of Christ Facebook page, or you can get or you can check out our YouTube channel, Walking Through History. You can catch up on those and see how we have arrived to where we are today. And speaking of arriving of, uh, to where we are today, Alan, uh, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Hope you're well. Why don't you catch us up real fast? Give us a little synopsis. Of, of how we've gotten to where we are in Ruth and what we can look forward to as we go throughout these next four studies. We, we get our first uh, first inkling of where this falls in the, in the story of the Bible just from verse one during the time of the judges. So we know, we know it falls in that roughly, you know, up, up to about 400 year period. We don't know exactly where. Um, toward the end of the book, we're going to get kind of a, um, a, chronology and a, a genealogy that that gives us a little more information but uh but really not not enough to know exactly i mean even within a decade or two you know this could be within several hundred years uh time frame we don't know exactly when but we at least see uh the contrast we're supposed to i think there's a reason um there's a reason this book at least in our protestant bibles you know that is put right after the judges because of this opening statement but this is this is one of those interesting books that uh, hits so many different um styles and points and, and literary features uh, so if we're putting it chronologically yeah putting it next to judges sounds pretty good but uh, we're going to hit so many uh, so many themes of uh, just you know, worthy womanhood and and righteousness and wisdom. Uh, this is this is still kind of a historical book, but it's there's a lot of there's a lot probably the most dialogue you'll see in in any other four chapters in the entire Bible. It's there's right. a ton of dialogue, but it is still within a historical uh, historical setting. So uh, it, it's interesting that. If you look at some of the older, uh, like the Jewish Bibles, how they organize their Bible, it's a little different than the way we typically see it. You know, we we go from, you know, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. This is thrown in with all the historical books. Well, in the uh, or the the Jewish Bibles, they do it a little bit differently. Actually, you find Ruth after either uh, either right after Proverbs mm -hmm. and before before Song of Solomon or right after Song of Solomon, if I, depending on the, the type of Jewish Bible that you have. And that's interesting because what is the last chapter of Proverbs? Well, it's Proverbs 31, which is about the worthy woman. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after Proverbs and also a, a book of wisdom, you have a real life example of both of those things. And then if Song of Solomon comes after Ruth in that Bible, then you have uh, a story of uh, about love and and marriage and that comes right after Ruth or possibly you know that then Ruth so you uh, so you have Ruth can be perfectly suited and perfectly put into several different ways just depending on how you're organizing all of these books uh, so I think we'll see that as we 
uh, as we go through just hitting those those themes of love, those themes of uh, faithfulness, those themes of wisdom. Uh, and of course, you know, we just got done with the judges. This is a complete contrast to what we just have read, especially the last few chapters of Judges, uh, just the, the dark depravity that existed in that time in Israel. This is a just a refreshing breath of fresh air uh, to to come to to see that that's not entirely the case. I mean, it's widely the case throughout this time period, but there are still good people. There are still a uh, we talked about a remnant left over by God. There are still there are still some that are trying to do do their best in in a bad situation. Right, and and once we get into this text, we're going to really see that hope spring to life. But let's be honest: once we get right into the the, the opening words of this book of Ruth, uh, things still are not looking so great. <laughs> They're not looking so great at all because we read there in the first chapter that during the time of the judges, already uh, that's already setting us up. Uh oh, this is going to be bad. This this is not going to be <laughs> a, a good writing more than likely because we know of of how bad the the judges' stories often were. Uh, there was a man. There was a famine in the land. Sounds par for the course. A man left Bethlehem. Okay, maybe depending on depending on who's reading this, what time. Maybe the the, the inclusion of Bethlehem gives them the, the the hope of there being a hero of some sort. Um, maybe that's the case, but we're going to quickly find out that's not the case at all here. That a man left Bethlehem and Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. The man's name was Elimelech. And his wife's name was Naomi. The names of the two sons were Malone and, and Kilion. And they were Ephra, Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And she was left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One's, one was named Or, Orpah. And the second was named Ruth. And after they lived in Moab about 10 years, both Malone and Kilion died, and Naomi was left without her two children and without her husband. So again, we get it. We get into what an introduction. <laughs> I mean, it's it really starts on a downer that you have here within this text. People who are leaving, they're leaving, they're leaving lands of Israel to travel into pagan lands, which of course that's par for the course of what we're thinking with judges because. That the judges, the judges' story is really about Israel becoming like Canaan, the Jewish people becoming like pagan Canaanites, and here we have what 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 is setting up for us, if we're if we're reading this after Judges, of being just a continuation of that same story. It is in essence a different chapter of the same book. Um, Alan, Alan, what do you think about the, the this whole this whole uh, this whole plan of them to leave Israel? And to go into pagan lands, even if there is a famine. Let me ask this. Why might there have been a famine in Israel if this is taking place during the time of the judges? Well, we didn't read about any famines in judges, but it would make sense that uh, God would not just be sending other nations to come and punish them for some of the things that they've done. He talks about several other ways that he uses uh, famine included pestilence, you know, plagues, all of these things are, are possible uh, to happen if you don't follow my commands. That's what he says throughout, you know, Deuteronomy and, and all of the law there. So we didn't read about them in judges, but see here we see that this is, uh, the way this is, but this isn't probably just the only famine that ever happened in the time of judges. I'm sure God sent plenty of famines, mm -hmm. plenty of different, you know, plagues, locusts, whatever it is on top of all of the, the Midianites and the Philistines and the, the whoever's that came in and, and caused them problems just to try to get them to turn away. And there's, uh, there's a lot that we don't see in, in the background of this, just by reading a translation of the, the Hebrew text here, all of these, all of these names are going to provide a little bit of foreshadowing or pro provide a little bit of, of humor to the story. Uh, even verse one, there was a famine in the land and a man left Bethlehem. Well, that name Bethlehem literally means, you know, like bread basket or a house of bread. <laughs> so, 
you're it's kind of ironic you're leaving this name you know this city called house of bread because there's no bread in the land and and this guy is leaving well what's his name mean his name means uh, my god is king well he's essentially given up on god rescuing them and you know he's abandoning by leaving uh leaving the territory leaving his and this was more than just like hey we're gonna we're gonna move over here just because they're you know we can make a little money in return i mean obviously they're there for a long time i don't know that they had any plans to return they're they're leaving and this and this is again this isn't just like we do today we sell our home we move around find a new job well they their house and their territory their land is their uh, ancestral homes you know these lands passed from generation to generation it was a it was a big deal that this a certain plot of land stayed in the family in perpetuity forever so uh, to just abandon this and you know be done leave uh, is very very odd this is just not something that that was done or should have been done especially by if by someone with their name my you know my god is king definitely not living up to the name we'll say that exactly and then going further with the names we have naomi which uh, means pleasant okay you know that sounds like she's gonna do well uh and then you have the two sons well this, that's where it kind of turns dark again there uh <laughs> they mean sickly and weak or failing <laughs> so you <laughs> I mean, if you're, you got a kid, don't, don't name your kids Malin or Chili. And these are not, that's why you don't hear people using these names because they mean sick and weak. And it makes sense. Their, their fate in this story is uh, because they end up dying pretty quickly. And then later on, Naomi is going to, you know, don't call me Naomi, you know, don't call me pleasant. It's, right. it's definitely not been very pleasant throughout this time. But, but again, they lived in Moab for, for 10 years um, long enough for the the two sons to get married and then uh, both of them died so they're she was gone a long time and like I said I don't know what the original plans were but you know if it's more than just you know just traveling to visit friends or something and return home then this is really just kind of abandoning you know God's God's rejected us God's not com coming to rescue us let's go somewhere else and maybe we'll have better luck there Right. And it, it does seem that this was this was a move and, and that would that was going to be uh, indefinite at best. And, I mean, they were there for 10 years after they lived in Moab for 10 years. Uh, then this happened with the death of of the two sons, which was preceded by the death of the father. Uh, but, but building off what you talked about with with the husband's name, Elimelech. The, the fact that he did leave the land that had been given to him by God in order to go into a, a paganistic land. And then on top of that, he's also allowing his sons to marry Moabite women. Uh, just go ahead and, and get it out of the way because we're going to, it, it plays, it, it plays a strong part in the story. Moabite women were not exactly <laughs> well, uh, they're, they're not right. exactly well described in scripture. What I mean by that, it's not that they are not described. They are described, but they're always described in very poor terms. And they always seem to set themselves up as being involved in uh, not so great things, mainly mainly seduction and, and sexual immorality and, and such. We can see that within the uh, within previous books that we talked about. We talked about Phineas in the last class and how he was uh, early on in his life. He was so zealous for God. Uh, and we reference, I believe it's Numbers 25 where the Moabite women were sent into the camp of Israel and they were, they were corrupting the men of Israel. And Phineas is the one that hopped up and, and got to work there. Um, looking at that story, number 25, even going back to, to Genesis 38 with Tamar. And then that has to do, of course, with Judah. And so we have Judah and the Moabites here mixing, not good. And then, then Alan, a little trivia for you. Uh, the, the Moabites, where do they come from originally? What, what, is, what is their, what, what are the roots of, of that, that particular nation? I mean, their origin story is a story of just sexual debauchery. They, right. uh, you know, lot, they are descended from Lot and his two daughters that, you know, got him drunk and, and had children by him. They had Moab and had Ammon. So they're, they're just the very beginning of their nation was, was conceived in, you know, this kind of, uh, this kind of terrible way. 
Right. So th everything is setting up for this to be, again, nothing more than a continuation, <coughs> excuse me, of the negative, the negative circumstances surrounding the judge's story. And let's continue on in the text and just see what, what is Na Naomi going to do at this point. Her husband's dead. Her sons are dead. All she has here are her two daughter-in-laws. And this is not exactly the time in, in human history where, where three women banding together is really going to, uh, to, to do well. They're not really set up for success in this moment. This is what Naomi does, that she and her daughters-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because they heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's needs by providing them food. So the famine at this point seems to have uh, subsided, and now there's food within the land. Now it's time for them to go back. And she left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to them, each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of, of a new husband. She kissed them and they wept loudly. And they said to her, we insist on returning with you to your people. But Naomi replied, return home, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Am I able to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Go on, for I too am old, or for I am too old to have an, another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me to have a husband tonight and to bear sons, would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourselves from remarrying? No, my daughters, my life is much too bitter for you to share because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Again, they wept loudly, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, the text says that Ruth clung to her, and Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. The, the, it, it, it is, it, we have to have a heart for what's going on here. This surely was a very emotional moment for, for these ladies to be involved in. Naomi I think one of the things that, that we need to establish about Naomi is that she seems to be very much concerned with, with lineage and with descendants and with making sure that there is offspring. I, I think that's going to play a part in this entire book as we go uh, through these four chapters. And, and here we are started off, we, we start off by seeing that, that it seems like she genuinely cares for these, for these two women that, you know, there's nothing I can do for you. You, you just need to go home restart your life. Uh, I, I cannot do anything for you. And, and while that might seem really great on the surface, at the same time, you know, there's kind of this, this strange thing that's happening because here's this woman who ought to be a follower of God. And to think that, that the, here are two Moabite women who would come back with her to Israel and the presumption would be that they would serve God in Israel. But now she's saying, no, you just go back and you serve your other gods. I, I don't know, Alan, it, as I read this, it just seemed it seems strange. It does, doesn't seem to really sit well with me the way Naomi is behaving the entire way through this particular section of, of, of what's told in the story. Yeah, as, as I've studied for this class <clears throat> recently, I've, I've definitely, my opinion of Naomi before was just like, you know, sad old woman, turns out great at the end, you know, nothing really uh, you know, no big deal with her, but you, you definitely see a, the bitterness that she mentions here um and i mean granted like she's she has every right to be i think she's had but, a rough life, i mean she's had she's had a rough life so i understand but but yeah she's i think she's a product of her times just uh, the fact that her and her husband were um you know quickly willing to abandon the the inheritance that was given to them uh in the face of a famine and not put their trust in god uh, they're clearly, you know, they don't really understand the importance of being uh, part of God's, uh, God's family, God's nation here. Uh, otherwise, they would have known that, you know, this is a chance, you know, Ruth and Ruth and Orpah, this is a chance to bring them into that into that group. I mean, it was un uncommon for non Israelites to become part of the nation of Israel by uh, by putting away their foreign gods and, and joining. And we see that with Rahab. Uh, we see that a lot, actually, even within the judges, guys like uh, uh, Caleb and Othniel that, you know, are likely not even uh, native Israelites that 
uh, kind of marry into marry into the family. So you would think that, you know, hey, they're willing to go with her. This is great. I mean, they have a chance to be part of God's, uh, God's holy nation. And like you said, she's like, no, go back to your own gods. I mean, who would say that if you really, I mean, how, how could we, you or I say that and say, yeah, go back to your old life. It'll be fine. Like, no, I mean, we know the truth. We know that that is a sentence of eternal death if we tell someone to do that and they do it. So uh, anything that she can do to get them to come with her and stay with her, uh, you know, that's what a good Israelite should be doing. But uh, so clearly, I think she just, you know, her level of faith, level of belief, level of understanding is is very low. Um, and to the credit of, of the two... Uh, well, you mentioned, I was going to mention you, uh, she definitely is concerned about lineage. Uh, she's well versed with all of the, um, all of the rules in terms of uh, what we'll see throughout the rest of the book, this leveret, these leveret rules, leveret traditions, uh, how uh, you mentioned like the story of Tamar in Genesis chapter 38. That's a really good um really good story to look at in uh, as we're studying Ruth because that kind of plays itself out throughout that story Tamar marries Judah's oldest son and the oldest son dies so he gives the second son to Tamar so he can have a have a a, a grandson for Judah and the, that line can continue well then he dies and then the third son is supposed to be given to Tamar as a husband, but he's too young for a time. And then that never happens. Well, that's kind of what's happening here that Naomi's talking about. She says, I don't have any more sons to give you. Even if I was, you know, young enough to still bear sons, well, you'd have to wait 18 or so many years for them to grow up. And, and both of those girls would be older now. So, uh, so the, the leveret, you know, option is kind of, kind of gone. So she's just like, eh just go back home. You're still young. You can find a husband. You can have a chance at, you know, having a good life. Um, possibly she also is thinking about what her life is going to be like too. I mean, Naomi's too old to, re to get remarried. She's a widow. She's has no chance of really achieving anything more than just the lowest of poverty at this point. And for Ruth and Ruth and Orpa to to follow her would be con sentencing them to basically the same thing, you know, unlikely to remarry, uh, living. I mean, at least Ruth and Orpa are still young, so they could maybe, you know, eke out a living. But Naomi's unlikely. I mean, she's already old. She's uh, she's not hardly able to get out into the fields and glean. That we'll see later. So she's pretty much resigned herself to a, a quick death. And I guess she's just thinking, you know, what's the point of dragging Ruth and Orpah down with me? Yeah, the, 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 the characteristic of loyalty doesn't exactly seem to be a strong suit of Naomi, which as we're looking at these two, these two books and, and comparing them, uh, there's a strong contrast from, from Judges to Ruth of the hope of, the, of, of hope for the future. And I think there's a strong internal contrast here between Naomi and Ruth and that's going to be especially exemplified here beginning verse 16 where Naomi has just told told Ruth hey you need to go you need to go back to your gods go follow your sister-in-law but Ruth replies in verse 16 don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you for wherever you go I will go and wherever you live I will live your people will be my people your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. And so the two of them then travel until they came to Bethlehem. And when they ent entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about their arrival and the local women exclaim, can this, be, can this be Naomi? She says in verse 20, Naomi responds to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. And for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, which is not really true. They, they went away because there was nothing there where they were. 
but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has opposed me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi came back from the territory of Moab with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabitess, and they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Again, again even just here, we see, we see the, the different character between these two women. We have this old woman who is seemingly very bitter at this point. If she's not blaming God, although it's, I mean, she, she's at least stating a matter of fact that she believes that God was the one that, that brought all this about. Uh, wh whether that's blame or not, I don't know. But at the very least, she's very bitter of what has happened. And, and, and yet, Ruth is still willing to stick it out with this woman, which is so impressive to me. And, uh, you know, as, as I was thinking about this particular thing, I think about uh, it being at th this text I've heard at weddings before. And I, I guess in the wedding context, that makes sense. But going back and looking at it, this is not a romantic thing that's taking place here. It, it's not romantic intimacy. It's, it's just being loyal to, to other people, loyal to those who are yours. And uh, that loyalty, again, lacking, in, lacking I think, on, in one character here to a great degree, but very much present in another. And that's going to that's gonna show as we go throughout the text from, from Ruth's perspective, it's not just loyalty to, to Naomi, but I think it's just loyalty to doing the right thing and, and having the right type of character. What we see here in verses 16 and 17, it sets up who Ruth shows herself to be as we go throughout the rest of this text. Alan, what do you have here uh, in this closing section on chapter one before we finish up for today? One of the reasons I think why this is is mentioned in in the setting of a wedding is is this word clung right here, verse fourteen. I think that's the uh, yeah. same word that's used in Genesis chapter two when it talks mm -hmm. about the husband shall uh, leave his father and mother and cling to his uh, to his wife. No old so school, old school, and it's leaving and cleaving. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, obviously in the setting of a husband and wife you know you can uh, extend that to you know a, a sexual relationship but I mean that just means uh, by itself and I think here just means you know attaching to and 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 living with being with and that's what she says you know wherever you go I will go I mean she even says even where you die I will die and there I will be buried well I mean Naomi's likely to die first so there could be 10, 20, 30 years after Naomi dies before Ruth dies. Well, she's not planning on even leaving then after death, uh, after Naomi dies, she's going to be buried next to her. And I think that's um, kind of a call back to what Naomi is really more worried about throughout this whole book is just the extending of their line. Uh, they're, they lost their two sons. Uh, their, their family name, their line is ending and you know ruth saying here i'm going to do whatever i can i think to help that continue and that's uh, that's what ends up happening ruth is able to eventually marry and have a son and and that line will continue uh, for and that's how the book ends it continues all the way to uh, to david uh, so there's i think there's a little bit of a uh, understanding there of ruth but but yeah i <laughs> I would be surprised too. I mean, obviously she married some, some Israelites. So she's heard of Yahweh God, but uh, Naomi told her to go back to her gods. Uh, why would she say that if Ruth had already abandoned those gods and was a, you know, practicing Yahweh worshiper, you know, she probably still even worships those gods just because that's what, you know, she grew up doing, but uh, she's, so I don't even know that this statement is necessarily like I'm abandoning those. This is really just, I'm staying with you, Naomi. But, um, but even that is, is just powerful. Just the fact that she's going to leave her home, leave her, uh, leave her chance of, of even remarrying and finding another Moabite husband and, you know, living a normal life. I mean, she's, she's giving that away and, you know, she makes a vow to the God, a vow to the Lord to, you know, punish me if she doesn't stay with Naomi the rest of her life. Uh, and I mean, that was strong enough that Naomi stopped, <laughs> stopped pestering her about it. 
Yeah, she. I mean, she she knows once once God has been brought into this conversation, mm-hmm. there's nothing else that can be done. So why why argue with someone who is this committed to really bring this? Um, it, it's not a. She's obviously not cursing herself, but she's saying, "Hey, if I do, if I if I don't follow through on this vow, then I I I expect to be cursed." Yeah. What's Naomi going to do at this point? She's going to be quiet and let's get on whatever we're riding and let's go back to Bethlehem. She's she's making a covenant right here. I mean, just yeah, just in the same way that God and His people made a covenant, just in the same way that two people that get married make a covenant. She's uh, she's making. I mean, albeit an informal one here, but it was. It, I mean, in to me, no different than uh, than the same kind of covenants you make when you get married. You vow to uh, to stay in that relationship for, uh, until death separates you. So mm-hmm. she's, she's doing the same, uh, the same type of thing here. And, and she, she keeps that covenant. So yep, absolutely. Um, e- even though, I mean, obviously she probably had very little understanding about the covenant of Israel and the law of Moses and all that stuff. It doesn't really matter. She, at, she, at least, like you mentioned, she's, um, she's, um, she's showing her character here. Mm-hmm. She is showing the goodness that she had, and and it's I think that's be, because of that that she is brought into the story, brought in by God. Uh, we we kind of forgot about God for a minute, but notice some of the ways that He's kind of in control of this whole story. Um, you know, there's the famine in the land because of the time of the judges. Um, Naomi even mentions because she had heard verse six, she'd heard that the Lord had paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. So he's kind of in the background controlling all of this. I mean, there's famines to, you know, punish the people. Uh, he remembers them and he provides for them again. Uh, Naomi mentions how, you know, she's kind of blaming God this whole time. You know, the Lord brought me back empty. Uh, the Lord has opposed me. I mean, how true those statements are or are those just the the statements of a bitter woman i don't know but clearly there's uh, the lord is in control of this entire story and i think it's for the benefit of uh not just of ruth definitely but even to naomi in a way too you know she's going to be naomi's going to be taken care of despite all this bitterness down the road right it- as far as what is stated, the Lord having done, I think there's only only a couple couple places where where that where we can, I believe, have a full confidence in in the Lord actually acting in that moment. I think the first one would be that He was providing them what they needed in the land again. Mm-hmm. The second one's going to be all the way at the end where where He granted granted Boaz and, and Ruth. Spoiler alert: If you haven't read the story, grants them a child. <laughs> Uh, but everywhere else, the Lord is is either simply referred to, or it's the the uh, assumption that the Lord is is doing a particular thing. Which I think, as we're looking through the story, we could probably probably assume that yeah, the, the Lord is certainly very much at work behind the scenes in this story. He's not mentioned a ton, but it's really an, an underlying working that, that the Lord is doing here within the story. Uh, and I think we'll see that even more as we get into the next chapter with his providence just being on full display, where somehow, some way, don't ask me how, I couldn't explain it, but he brings the proper people together <laughs> and, and allows for a relationship to begin that's going to continue uh, to grow as we go throughout this particular this particular text. Alan, anything else before we close out for today? It's good. Uh- we, we promised a happier story, but it's the beginning did kind of, kind of bring you down in judges, but it gets better. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and you, we have a, a small glimpse of that in the wonderful loyalty that is displayed by, by Ruth here within this first chapter. That's only a glimpse of her character. That character is going to continue to be on display and it's going to be absolutely affirmed by, by the next character that's going to enter the story. Once we get into chapter two, this upcoming Friday. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments about what you find here within Ruth or what you might find with any other text of scripture, uh, please feel free, to re- feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, comments, let us know. We'd love to interact with you about God's word and, and serve you as best we can in that way. Uh, if you're looking for a group of disciples to study with tomorrow night, we'll be continuing 
our Bible classes tomorrow night, 7 p.m. at 384 Pleasant Plains Road as a brother, Alan Brown, continues to lead our adult class in Ecclesiastes. We also have classes for all other ages. Let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we'd love for you to join us if you can in person. If not, please feel free to join us here on the live stream. Appreciate you being with us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. God bless you in all that you do and hope you'll join us next time as we continue our walk through history, the story of God within his word. Take care. Have a good day.